it's scary to come up here because I was, I've had so many people tell me that they've been praying for me, and you know that means the world, so thank you. I think that's the blessing of being part of a church family. Wherever we have a weakness, we kind of come in and feel for each other and encourage. That's why we need to be united. But Well, let us pray before we dive into this. Dear Lord, thank you for another beautiful day. Thank you for giving us the privilege of being Seventh-day Adventists and for giving us the truth in the Bible. And Lord, today as we look at another beloved story that you've given us, I ask that you can help us to truly just take away practical life lessons, Lord, and warnings so that we may learn from other mistakes and victories. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before I begin, disclaimer, I'm not a perfect person, so I'm sorry if I make mistakes, but, um, you know, we're all learning here. But the story I'll be speaking and sharing upon today is found in 2 Kings chapter 5. So who has their Bibles or phone, maybe? No? Follow me. It'll make following a lot easier. <laughs> so basically what... What I want you guys to do as we're going from verse to verse, I want you to, whatever character we're talking about, really put yourself in that perspective. Think about what would they think? What would be surrounding them? What would be running through their thoughts? And it, it makes the Bible come alive in a different way. So we'll be starting in 1 Kings chapter 5. It says, so 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman was a commander of an army, of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. So what have we learned so far, just in this one verse of our main, first main character? Yeah, this can be a conversation, that's cool, that's cool. He was, a he was a soldier, yes, and God gave him what? Victory, but what is the main problem here? He has leprosy. Okay, so this whole story revolves around this one problem, this leprosy problem. So there's three ways he could have, Naaman could have responded to this leprosy problem. A, he could have ignored it. B, he could have denied it. Or C, he could have sought for help. So let's continue in the story. In verse 2 it says, it's, we get introduced to our second main character, or another character, and now it's talking about a servant girl. It says, Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. In verse 3, She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Let's pause there. So this servant girl, we don't know how old she is, but imagine, if you... If everything you knew, your family, your church family, your friends, your cousins, everything that is comforting to you suddenly gets taken away and you get plopped into a brand new place with new people, a new religion, how easy would it have been for her to just conform to that? How easy. But no, she remembered. Her parents taught her, you know, this is truth. And so whenever, when she was faced to go through that trial, she remembered that there's a prophet, and because she remained faithful, she was able to give Naaman a solution. And that's powerful because when we go through life and we go through different struggles, if we remember the truth that our parents taught us, we are able to point someone else to a solution. So that's just really encouraging to me. And so Naaman, yeah, of course, okay, there's a solution. Let's go and find out more about this solution. And so Naaman went to, remember, because he's a soldier, so someone above him, his king. So he asked, hey, can I go and inquire of this solution? And the king's like, yeah, I'll even send a, la a letter to the king of Israel explaining your whole situation. So he's like, okay, well, let's go. So everyone's on board. The king of Aram wrote a letter to the king of Israel explaining that Naaman simply wants to be healed from this leprosy problem. But let's see how the king responded. In verse 11, nope, sorry, <laughs> verse 7. As soon as, <laughs> as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring 
Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? I was thinking about this, and I can't even, I can't even be mad at the king. Because there's so many times when someone is coming and simply asking us for help or asking for guidance, and we turn around and we make it about ourselves. We assume the worst about them, and we just make a whole problem out of something that wasn't even there. The king missed the fact that someone from the world was coming towards Israel to look for a solution. And so many times when we assume the worst about people, we miss the divine appointment. See, God was opening that door, but since the king of Israel made it about himself, he completely missed it. And so that's a warning to us that, you know, we got to forget about ourselves like we really do. Put away our prejudice, put away whatever, you know, whatever we're carrying and simply listen when people are looking for help. And so, thankfully, Elisha caught wind that Naaman was looking for a solution. And so he said, okay, simply send him to me. Like, stop, stop worrying about this king. You obviously can't handle it. So send him to me. That's who he's looking for anyways, right? He's looking for the prophet, for a solution. But, okay, so Naaman is now with his chariots and his servants going to look for it, for, to Elisha. But before, they, okay, wait, there's another point right there. <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool as canvassers if instead of us having to go and knock on doors, us looking for them, they're coming to us? You know, and that can happen. You know, when we have something, when, when people catch wind that in the Seventh-day Adventist church there is healing, they will be coming to our doors. We won't have to be going out to them. So that's just, that's something we, should, we, we can pray for. So before Naaman was able to come to the door of the prophet, Elisha sent another messenger. He simply said, let's see, let's see, verse 10. Would someone like to read that in a loud angelic voice? Verse 10. Okay, two points here. Who was delivering this message? Was it the prophet or was it his servant? His servant. That is so cool. See, so many times we want to be the ones performing the miracle. We want to be the ones, you know, the center of attention. But so many times it's simply our privilege to deliver what the prophet has told us. And that is so cool because when we embrace that and when we humbly say, okay, all, uh, my only duty is to say what you've convicted me of to, to this other person. When we take that personally it's, and step back from the picture, we realize that we become part of someone's story of redemption. Because without the little servant girl who was faithful and remembered the prophet, and without the servant of Elisha that went and met Naaman, this story would have some serious gaps, right? And so this shows us that God is giving us the privilege always to be messengers, whether we're children, or servants, students, siblings, cousins, there's always an opportunity to minister to someone else. So that, that's point A. So point B, Naaman got the instructions, right? He said, go to the Jordan and go dip how many times? Seven, Seven times. So here's his solution to this leprosy problem, right? But how did Naaman respond? He was angry. In verse 11 we see, but Naaman went away angry. He said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on my name of the Lord his God and wave his hands over me and spot and cure me of my leprosy. Again, I can't even be mad at these characters because we do the same exact thing, right? There's so many times where I go and I'm like, God, please show me the solution. Please, what do I do? And then when he gives it to us, we're like, oh, Nah, not about that. Like, like, for example, one time, one time I went to the cafeteria. Thank you, cafeteria people. I worked all academy through the calf, so thank you for your sacrifice. So one time I poured myself a bowl of soup, right? And I sat down, I'm like, wow, this looks so good. I was so hungry. And I'm like, wow, it looks so good. And I was expecting it to be savory. And I put it in my mouth and it was sweet and my body rejected it. Was there something wrong with the soup? No, it was my preconception 
that made my body reject it, right? <laughs> Nothing was wrong with the soup. It's just that I was expecting something different, so I was like, Bleh. <laughs> So that's what happens. Naaman was expecting him to go, one, two, three, boom, healed. But when that wasn't the solution, he was like, oh, no, he rejected it. And that's, what, that's, that's a warning to us, that if we truly want to come with a spirit of understanding and a spirit of learning, we need to let go of our preconceptions and yield that. Another reason why he was angry and he was upset was because he was prideful. <laughs> I was reading this and I was like, prideful? What's this going in the river have to do with being prideful? So I was reading in Prophets and Kings, and it was saying that, you know, the Jordan River wasn't necessarily the cleanest river. <laughs> and he was a commander, so I'm sure he lived a pretty nice life, right? And so to him, the thought of having the, you know, to him in his mind, there are many other rivers <laughs> that are cleaner, and to him that would make, you know, more sense than having to go to the Jordan. And that just shows us another point. That sometimes we see, in our mind, in our sinful, little, tiny minds, we see so many better options than what God is offering. But thankfully, God doesn't go according to our expectations. He exceeds them. Amen. And so he, he rejected the, the solution to this leprosy problem because of his expectations and because of his pride. But thankfully, let's see what he did. So, but before we even answer that question, let's go back to this leprosy thing. Why was it such a, wh why was this a serious thing? Was it just like, ah, oh, it's just leprosy? Like, what is leprosy? It's okay, you guys can respond, that's cool. Yes, there you go. So, it's basically an infection that damages the nerves and slowly kills them. So if someone gets snagged on like a rusty nail and it starts to bleed, you don't necessarily notice because your pain receptors are, they're out. And so, you know, you just keep bleeding and bleeding and then like dust gets into it and a dog licks it or something. I'm sorry, that was, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then it gets infected, you know, and then by the time you realize it, it's too late and they have to cut off the whole arm, you know. And so it's detrimental. But... <laughs> On a more serious note, when I was thinking about this, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's pretty awful. But then it hit me, I was like, what? Sin. That's sin. Sin is something that is slowly killing us by making us blind to the spiritual danger that we're in. It slowly makes us forget, you know, that, oh, you know, it's just, you know, it's just whatever. And it slowly makes us comfortable, or, or it just completely blinds us to the fact that we're bleeding and that we need help until it's too late and we're dying spiritually. So that was the problem. But Naaman had the solution. And thankfully, what did Naaman do? He went, <laughs> he listened to the instructions. Right? Okay, so let's see what, what enabled him to go down to the river. So in Prophets and Kings it says, The faith of Naaman was being tested, while pride struggled for the mastery, but faith conquered, and haughty Syrian Naaman yielded his pride of heart and bowed in submission to the revealed will of Jehovah. So, it gives us the equation right there. When we yield our pride, when we bow in submission to the instruction the prophet had given us, when we obey the solution, healing comes afterwards. That's the outcome. That's simple, right? When we yield our preconceptions, we can become healed. When we obey Christ, we can become healed, right? That's, that's simply what this, this is trying to remind us. And so I was thinking of this, you know, the moment Naaman decided to go down to the river, half of his journey was over. Because when we decide something, the rest is history, right? Because your body follows. And so in verse 14 it said, so he went down. 
and he was healed. And to me, friends, choosing to go down to the river and choosing to accept God to help you is the hardest part. Because in my life, I lived some pretty dark months. And the, the reason for that is because I embraced my leprosy. I embraced my life without Christ and without the instruction of the prophet. I embraced, you know, being blinded by the world. I forgot that I was in a great controversy. I forgot that I had a mission. And friends, you know what the only thing that that left me feeling like? Trash, guilty, alone, and miserable. That's the outcome of rejecting the solution. But I know you already know that. You know that the world has nothing to offer. You know that. And so my question is what's stopping you from being healed? What's stopping you from becoming the spiritual leader you admire? The spiritual mentor you admire, the spiritual mentor that you just love, what's stopping you from going 110% with God? We have the solution. Are we going to respond to it like Naaman did, in anger and stomp away? Or are we going to embrace it and see what God has after the healing? Because it's when we are healed that we have something to give. Because now we can say God works. Because that's what God did to me. So we know the truth. And so let's see what Naaman did after he was healed. So because he was healed, he was able to testify that God lived. And that's really cool. Because in, when we go back to the story previously, he always referenced to God as like their God. But after his healing, he admitted that God was the greatest God in a personal sense. So his healing resulted in him believing in God, which just shows the power but anyways, so in verse 15, it says, Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God, and he stood before him and said, Yes, sorry, <laughs> and said, Now I know that there is a God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. So Naaman was trying to, you know, give something to repay for him being healed, right? He was trying to give a gift to the prophet, but the prophet, how did he respond? He said no. Pastor Powell pointed this out to me, and I thought it was really cool. Um, you know, when we are healed, healing from God is a gift, right? It was free. And so if the prophet would have received the gift, he would have kind of put an amount of value f to his healing, you know. But the cool, the cool thing is that the worth of the miracle that God does in transforming you makes everything in this world look like nothing. Because what God has to offer you makes everything else look like trash. So there's nothing that Naaman could have given to even begin to reveal the worth of his healing. So I thought that was really cool. And before the story ends, Naaman is healed. He embraced it. He yielded. He threw away his pride, and he submitted to the obedience of what the prophet had, the prophet's instruction. And it's almost a happy story, but we get introduced to another character. Does anyone know his name? Gehazi. Let's look at him. Let's look at what, what happened here. So, the prophet said, no, 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 take your gifts, you know, just take them. And so Naaman got up and took everything he left. But this servant was not okay with that. He was like, what? You're just going to let all that stuff go? Come on, he was giving it to you. Discontentment. He was watering the discontentment in his heart, and he let that grow. Friends, 
whenever there's a bad thought and we keep reminiscing and reminiscing and reminiscing and reminiscing and feeding it, it's only going to turn into actions because our thoughts become what we do. And his discontentment led him to come up with a plan, led him to actually start walking to Naaman, right, and to lie to him. He just straight up lied. He said, the master told me, and this is somber. It shows us that this messenger was going in the master's name but seeking self-gain. He was misrepresenting his master's name. And that's somber because Naaman believed him. Naaman didn't know any better, so he gave him his stuff, right? So his discontentment led Gehazi to lie. And what happened as a result of that? He ended up with leprosy. I don't mean to say that with a smile, but it's just a warning. Like, when we, when we, okay, so, when we keep embracing this discontentment, it leads us to lie, but before he, he lied twice. He lied to Naaman, and then what was the second time he lied? To the prophet. The prophet asked him, hey, bro, where were you? He was kind of almost giving him a way out. He could have said, oh, yeah, sorry, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Like, it could have clicked. But the thing with sin, it's a really slippery slope down fast. And because he already lied once, it was easy to lie to Elisha too. He simply, he lied again. And so that just shows us that when we embrace discontentment, it leads us to embrace sin, leads us to lie, which leads us down a slippery slope. And eventually he ended up with leprosy. And that's what happens when we become discontented with Jesus and the solution. Because there is nothing outside of Jesus. So if we reject Jesus, we're left with sin. That's it. And so simply, as I was reading this story, I just have to ask you on a personal level, you don't have to share this with anyone, but what's your leprosy? What's something that's been slowly killing your spiritual life? It's been slowly making you blind to the fact that we're in a great controversy, that you have a mission. And second question is, have you been healed from that? Because you have the solution, just like Naaman. It was quite simple. See, in the story of Naaman, the healing took place in the river. But was the healing in the river? No, it was in Christ. And so the beautiful part is that your freedom from this so-called sin problem is only waiting for your consent. It's only waiting for your choice. It's simple. <laughs> and so, my simple appeal to you is to really lay that at, at Jesus' feet, to decide to go to the river. And I know sometimes we're like for me, I became so comfortable in my sin. I didn't even want to let it go. I knew in my brain I needed to, but I didn't want to. So my first prayer was, Lord, help me to not want to want this. And that was the first step. And then soon enough, I slowly started to see that this leprosy thing is really, truly a problem. So friends, I just want to give you a moment to just silently reflect on what's something that you're still carrying that you need to give to Jesus.
I'm going to leave you with this last piece of advice. Someone told me, when you leave something, feet of Jesus, tell yourself, I'm free from that. And believe it. This went so far for me in my spiritual walk because every time Satan reminded me, oh, look, look, you're doing it again. Oh, you're, you're starting to think about it again. I said, I'm free from that. And if you keep saying that in your heart, you'll believe it. And what you believe becomes your action. So whenever Satan is there reminding you or that this leprosy is still killing your life, just answer back, I'm free from that. God has healed me from that, just like he healed Naaman. Thank you. Do we end with prayer? <laughs> All right, let's end with prayer. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us such simple instructions, Lord. Thank you for giving us the solution in Jesus. Thank you because your gift of salvation and healing is free. Thank you because you don't hold anything against us. And Lord, thank you for letting us be your children. Lord, we thank you because you are persistent. And Lord, we simply ask that this leprosy that has been holding us back for so long from going all the way with you, we lay that at your feet. And we thank you for the victory, Lord, that lies in you. We thank you for the freedom to be able to tell others of what you have done in our lives. And Lord, we ask that we may always remind Satan that we are free and we are happy and content in you, Lord. And I ask that as we go today, that we may keep drawing close to you. And we thank you for giving us more than what we deserve. In Jesus' name, amen.